Today, I want to talk about the alphabet soup. And you may wonder, what the heck is the alphabet soup? Well, you've heard a lot of different terms by now if you've been flying for a while, or even if you're starting, you may hear people say part 107, part 101, section 336, AMA. What does this all mean? And what is the difference between all of them? So this is what I'm going to go over in this course. Now, this video is part of my Drone 101 Beginner's Guide to Drone Enthusiasts. You can find this on Udemy, and I'm actually reshooting this video to make it compress into one, but the same information is found, and a lot more information is also found in that course. If you're a beginner, if you've never flown before, this is definitely a course that you need to get. Uh, it, will, it will help you with your first flight, it will help you safely fly and, and talk about regulation and talk about a whole lot of different things. So take a look at it, I put a link in the description. So the alphabet soup. AMA part 101, part 107, section 336, section 333, what does this all mean? The FAA has different regulation for different types of flying, and this is all related to drone flying. And over the years, because drone flying is kind of a new area for the FAA, the FAA has try, been trying to catch up with the regulation. And, and what you'll see is, you'll see that they've established some regulation in the past, and then all of a sudden they're coming up with new stuff. So, and this is still changing, by the way, as I'm recording this, the FAA has approved a, uh, a change to the FAA regulation. And uh, this is not in place yet. We have some information, but we don't have any final ruling. So as of now, this is still the regulation and it is going to change at least for hobbyists. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. So. The first one I want to talk about is Section 336, which is the special rules for model aircraft. If you are a, a hobbyist, if you're a newbie, if you're somebody who's just started to fly, this is the regulation that you're going to follow. Now you're going to say, what does section mean? Well, section means that Congress at one point established a set of rules and they told the FAA, hey, you have to make that into regulation, into the code of federal regulation, which is where the FAA regulation lives, okay? So Section 336 led the FAA to create what we call Part 101. When we talk about regulation, we talk about part. Part 101, Part 107 is another one. If you're a pilot, Part 61, Part 91, these are all different sections of the Code of Federal Regulation that uh, deal with FAA regulation, with flight regulation. Now remember, flight is the big umbrella. Flight is covered by the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. And within that regulation, there's different parts for different types of flying. If you're flying as a commercial pilot, the rules are going to be different than if you're flying as a private pilot, for example. Uh, so this is what we'll find in here. This is all the different uh, types of regulation that we'll see. The FAA, interestingly enough, even though Section 336 was designed by Congress, they still use the language Section 336 on their website to refer to anything that's uh, hobbyist related, anything that, that hobbyists are going to be following, even though the regulation in itself lives in Part 101 of the regulation. Okay, so hobbyist is the same as Section 336, it's the same as, section, as Part 101. So if you see these terms, they all mean exactly the same thing. So let's take a look at what is in, section, in, in part 101 of the regulation. And you can find that on your own if you want to go on the, the Code of Federal Regulation. It's a bit dry, so I'm going to give you kind of a synopsis right here and, and help you understand what that really means. So section 101 describes the rules governing the operation of model aircraft, okay? The requirements to be, uh, to be using these, th that regulation is that the aircraft is flown strictly for hobby or for recreational uses, okay? Hobby or recreational uses. You go out there and you go have fun. That's really the bottom line. The aircraft is no more than 55 pounds. For most people, this should not be a problem. And then the aircraft does not interfere with, at any point, any kind of aircraft flying up in the air with manned aircraft. So you have to give way to manned aircraft and you cannot interfere with manned aircraft. Okay, just remember that. And also it says in the regulation that when you're flying within five miles of an airport, then you, the operator, have to give notification to the airport before you fly. And in the course, there is a section where I will show you how to do this, how to find the phone number, how to contact them, how to find out if you actually are in the airspace. The last requirement, which is kind of a confusing one for some people, is that the aircraft has to be operated within what we call a set of community-based guidelines, okay, safety guidelines. Now, the question is, what does CBO mean? That's what community-based organization. 
And and the answer, and, and one of the questions that I see a lot is, do I have to join a CBO? And the answer, the short answer is no. Should you follow the guidelines that they are putting out there? Absolutely. The most popular CBO out there is the AMA. You may have heard that term, AMA, Academy for Model Aircraft. Is it a good idea to join an AMA if you're a hobbyist? I would say yes. I think the price is fairly low. You will get a lot of good advices from these people. They've been doing this for 50, 60, 70 years for a really long time. Model aircraft have been flying. Drones, the way we know them, quadcopters, as they've become very popular, it's kind of a new thing. A new thing. In the past, we've had uh, just model aircraft, little fixed wing aircraft flying around, and that's been going on forever. So these people have been doing this for a long time, and, and I think it would be a good idea if you want to join a CBO. Is it required? No, it's not. Should you? Absolutely. Now, to go back to the guy, Guidelines, these CBOs, including the AMA, have put out a set of guidelines that you should be following, and, and some of that information has made it back into the, uh, into the FAA regulation. Some of it, not all of it. You can find more information about the AMA by going on their website. It's right here. I'll put also a link in the description. Now, the next part of the alphabet soup is section 333. Now, section 333 is probably not something that you have to worry too much about. Prior to August 2016, the FAA had come up with a set of rules, and if pilots wanted to go around those rules, or, or if you want to break those rules, or, or not follow those rules, then they had to get um, a special approval, a waiver, okay, for certain of these restrictions. So under this, the FAA created the waiver and authorizations that were submitted under Section 333, and they were approved under Section 333. And pilots could get a waiver. Now, some waivers may still be out there. If you have a, a 333 exemption, you can still use it until it expires. There's a chance if you're watching this video that you don't have one of those, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. And the next thing that we have is Part 107. Now, Part 107 is Small Unmanned Aircraft Regulation, and this is the regulation for everything that is not recreational, okay? Part 101, recreational flight. Part 107, non-recreational flights. This is for anyone who's, op who's not operating under Part 101, okay? Anyone who's not doing stuff for fun is going to be falling under Part 107. If you operate under Part 107, you have to get a remote pilot certificate. And the way that you do this, and this is issued by the FAA, is you have to pass a written exam with the FAA in order to get that test. I also have a course available that is going to help you with this. I've helped several hundreds of people getting their tests passed uh, by doing this. So uh, please go ahead and take a look in the description. I'll also put a link for that course. Part 107 is going to be a different set of regulation than Part 101. And we we'll take a look in a minute as the comparison between Part 107 and Part 101. Now, you can either fly, once you have your Part 107, your remote pilot certificate, you can either fly as Part 107, or you can also still fly as a recreational pilot following Part 101. I have my Part 107, I go fly for my business, for a living, and I make money that way using Part 107. If I want to go and fly for fun and, and do videos of my kid or video of, of my dog, then I can go and do that under Recreational under Part 101. Having a Part 107 certificate does not mean that you are done completely with recreational flights, okay? It depends on the type of flying that you do. Here's a table, a little comparison between hobbyist and part 107. So hobbyist obviously is going to be used for hobby and for recreational use. Part 107 can be followed, uh, people that, that operate under part 107 can either follow recreational rules or they can also fly for commercial purposes, okay? That's what that line means, it's just a little confusing. What do you do under part 107, uh, under hobbyist? You're gonna follow part 101 and you're gonna follow CBO guidelines. Under part 107, you have to follow the FAA regulation under part 107, which is a little bit longer. In terms of notification, under hobbyist rules, you have to notify an airport if you are within five miles of that airport. So there are tools, and I'll show you this in the course uh, later on in the videos, uh, if you join the course, there is, a, there is a bunch of tools that you can use to do this. Under Part 107, it really depends. You're going to have to get an, a prior authorization if you're flying close to an airport that is in controlled airspace. Again, this is a bit more than what I want to do in this video, I want to cover, but just know that uh, there's different sets of rules for flying as a, as a Part 107 or as a hobbyist. 
As a hobbyist, it is okay to fly at night. As a part 107, you are required to have a waiver. I know this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but it is what it is. Under as a hobbyist, you are also allowed to fly over 400 feet. Now I wanna do a little side note in here. Be careful when you fly over 400 feet. I know it is technically allowed by uh, the, the hobbyists and the CBOs in most cases. Be very careful, you are sharing the airspace with other people. Personally, I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't go over 400 feet. I, there's plenty of room sub 400 feet where you can do a lot of good footage, a lot of good things. Just be very, very careful. The last thing that we need is, is one of us hitting a manned aircraft and, and that being in the news or even killing someone, God forbid. So be very careful. As a part 107, you are limited under 400 feet. And if you wanna go over, you have to get a waiver, which is fairly difficult to get. For both hobbyist and part 107, there is no flying over people. I cannot emphasize that enough. There is no flying allowed over people. Don't fly over people, very simple. There's also no flying out of line of sight, okay? You have to keep your drone within line of sight. And then the last thing is, there's no flying when there is any kind of emergency response uh, effort in place. So let's say that there's a crash on the highway and you decide that you're gonna go over and fly your drone. Don't do it because there's probably a helicopter that's trying to land on that site to go carry that person to the hospital and you're gonna be interfering with this and, and if that's the case, the helicopter is not gonna land for safety purposes and sometimes the airplane, the, the, the helicopter cannot take off because of somebody flying their drone around, which means that that person that's uh, between life and death could basically um, just not make it because of you flying your drone. Stay away from emergency responses. Same for wildfires. There's a lot of wildfires as I'm recording this video going on in California. Stay away from a hurricane. Stay away from um, just basically anything that has emergency responses. Let them do their job and then just watch the news from the, from the news helicopter or whatever it is. And the last thing I want to touch on is the registration because it's a little bit different, a little bit different between the two. As a hobbyist, you have to register your drone just like you do for part 107. But as a hobbyist, you only need to do one registration. You will get a number and you can slap that number on all the different devices that you have. As a part 107 pilot, you have to register each of the drones and each of them has a different number. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a difference here. So one of the question I hear all the time is, when is it commercial? When is it defined as commercial? Well, technically, there's really no such thing as commercial. The FA doesn't even use that term for talking about commercial pilot, for, for talking about, see, I said it, for talking about remote pilot. We do use it as, as just a, a saying, but it really, uh, there is no such thing. It's either hobbyist or non-hobbyist. Non-hobbyist is part 107. Hobbyist or, or fun uh, recreational flying is part 101. So, there are different scenarios where you're gonna be required to have a part 107 certificate. And I'm gonna say, there's really only one scenario if you think about it, okay? Whenever you are not flying for recreational purposes, then it becomes part 107, okay? Whenever you're not flying for recreational purposes, if you say, hey, I'm gonna grab my drone today, and I'm gonna go out and fly uh, and take pictures of the dog and the family or take pictures at the park or go ahead and take a video of uh, my favorite mountain or whatever it is, that's recreational purposes. If you say, hey, my friend asked me if I can go and fly uh, for his business. Immediately, it's not for recreational purposes. Somebody asks you to do the flight. You're not going out there to have fun. You may have fun doing it, but you're not going out there to have fun. You're basically not flying for recreational purposes. It is commercial, okay? There is a few questions online. Hey, what if I collect money? Obviously, if you collect money, this is past recreational purposes. It doesn't work. If you're furthering a business, whether it's yours or somebody else, even if you're not getting paid, it is still not a recreational purpose flight. Therefore, it is under part 107. One of the questions I see a lot is, can I still get paid as a hobbyist? And the answer is yes. And the answer is yes, because if the original intent of your flight was still for recreational purposes, but you happen to capture something that is worthy, Okay, let's say, let's take an example. You go out there and I live in the mountains. In the summer, we have a lot of rain. And when we have rain, we have flash floods, okay? Let's say you go out there for your flight, you're flying for fun, and all of a sudden you notice that there's a big mudslide coming down the mountain and you're gonna film this. And you're gonna film it 
it's kind of a major uh, event, or maybe there is an earthquake, or maybe there's a volcano eruption right here, all of a sudden in front of you. Now, this is newsworthy, right? The news are probably gonna call you when they see your video online and say, hey, can we use it? Or can we pay you for the footage? In this case, because the original intent of the flight was for recreational purposes, then it's okay, you can get paid. Because initially when you went out there, you weren't going out to get a mudslide, you weren't going out to get the volcano eruption, it just happened, okay? I hope this makes sense. Now, don't abuse this rule, okay? Don't abuse the fact that you can say, well, my intent was to go out and fly for fun and then uh, I happened to be at my friend's business and then I took a video. That doesn't work, all right? Be honest about it. If something happens, the FAA is always gonna side on the air of caution and, and get you in trouble. Trust me, I've been dealing with the FAA for a long time. Not that they're after people, uh, to go after people and get them and get them fined, but just be careful out there. There are rules and just follow them. If you want to find more information about flying uh, under part 101, but mostly, uh, take my course, Drone Flying 101. It's really affordable. I made it so that it can help people fly more safely. I cover a lot of information in there. I cover regulation. I cover airspace. I cover a lot of different tips for your first flight. So you can go out there. I do the very first flight with you, showing you what the controls do and everything. Uh, there's a lot of content. There's, I think, seven hours of content in this course. So go ahead and uh, use the link down there. And also don't forget to subscribe. This is a fairly new channel, but I'm trying to put more information on here. The more people subscribe, the more motivated I am to make videos like this. And, um, and I hope to help you in your drone career, whether you're part 107 or you're a hobbyist, I will have uh, videos for both type of people. All right, see you out there and uh, have a great day.